All righty. I'm going to go ahead and get started um, and welcome everyone. My name is Erin Harlow. I'm the commercial horticulture agent and the residential horticulture agent um, and the master gardener coordinator here in Columbia County with the University uh, of Florida. So today we're going to talk about what's eating my garden besides me. Uh, so you may be a member of the Victory 2020 garden community. Uh, so this is kind of one of our programs that we are doing with that group. Um, and we're getting a lot of questions about what's what pests are in my garden right now. So um, that's kind of what we wanted to cover, uh, what we're seeing. Uh, so I think I covered everything you guys mentioned. I did forget leaf miners and I apologize. So remind me and I'll talk about those um, as we go along. I do have Maxine uh, Hunter on as well. She's the horticulture agent in Marion County and she's gonna be helping me monitor that chat box. Um, so if you can't hear for some reason or you have a problem, we have a question, um, please go ahead and type it in that chat box and we can, we'll take, you know, we'll stop and, and answer questions for you. Okay. All right. So the outline that I want to do this morning, um, you know, we have an hour uh, and really as I was putting this together, an hour is not that much time. I could probably talk about an individual insect for an hour, um, but we're, we're gonna we're gonna move through this. So I wanted to cover some IPM principles or integrated pest management because I want you to take something away from this, um, not just being able to identify some of the insects in your garden, but also what do I do about them? Okay, we'll talk about thresholds, um, identification, prevention, and so what is IPM? Again, it's integrated pest management. And I want you to kind of think about this as we move through these insects, because um, when you think about your garden, you need to determine how you want to control those pests. And you really are gonna walk yourself through this, this IPM step, even if you don't realize it, okay? So I wanna talk about it. So it is the effective and environmentally sensitive approach to pest management. Um, and we're using that current um, information on the life cycle of the pest. You have to identify the pest. That's the first step, okay? So you have to know their life cycle. You wanna know how they interact with their environment. Um, and then also what's available to you in terms of pest control methods. Uh, and at what level are you gonna use those, those different options? So you wanna use that, that um, most economical means for you, and it, it really is specialized to you, okay? You wanna consider the least possible hazard to people, property, and of course the environment first. So when I walk you through some of these, we'll talk about uh, kind of the, the cultural or the bottom line, what's the most um, or the least hazardous, and then we'll kind of move up the line, just to give you guys some options. Okay, so the first thing we wanna do when we're talking about our IPM program um, is set our action thresholds. And what this means is uh, you have to decide how many insects for your garden is damaging. You know, if I see one um, little leaf beetle or flea beetle, I'm not too concerned. But if I start to see 20 or 30, I'm gonna get a little bit concerned. Um, this photo here, you can see these are uh, tobacco hornworms uh, that I picked off of my garden last week. Um, now I have a fairly large garden, so they're all the same size. They probably all uh, emerged at the same time. Uh, and so I, I picked them off. I've, I haven't actually seen any since, uh, maybe one, but my action threshold, you know, I was, I was three is okay. I'm not gonna do any pest control for that. Um, and so I chose to just pick them off. Now, if I find 20, that's gonna be a problem. So you have to set that threshold for yourself. Um, the most important thing is, is monitor and identify. So you need to walk through your garden fairly often uh, and, and just turn leaves over. Look for um, you know, holes in the leaves, look for things that are cut. Uh, and then once you find something, you need to identify it. You might find the pest, if you're lucky. You might find the damage, which is likely. So the holes in the leaves or the cut plant, or you might find um, the leftovers from the insect. So you can kind of see in this picture that caterpillar in the upper left-hand corner um, has some frass behind it, which is caterpillar poop, okay? Um, you might see that 
And if you can get good at, at identifying what the insect or pest is leaving behind, that can help you determine what's actually doing the damage. Okay. And that's what we're here for. You know, you can always, always ask your extension agent. Um, then we're going to look at prevention and then finally control. Okay. Uh, prevention is always going to be the first and then control. And, and keep in mind when we're talking about control, we're really talking about, we, or I should say, we are never talking about um, eradicating something uh, from your garden. That's almost impossible if you live in Florida. You are going to have pests. It's just figuring out what we can live with, okay? So the pests I'm gonna talk about today, um, and they are not in this order, um, I will tell you, but we'll talk about the Lepidopteras, which are your caterpillars, your coleopteras, your beetles and grubs, um, our true bugs, which are stink bugs, aphids, white flies, and thrips are not actually true bugs. Um, they're a Thysanroptera, um, excuse me. Um, so it's a different order. Uh, we'll talk about fire ants a little bit, uh, specifically for control. I think you guys can identify those. Uh, we will talk about mites, uh, grasshoppers and katydids, and then some mammals I threw in because I knew you guys, some of you were having some problems um, with some of the other, if you will. Okay. So let's go ahead and jump into this. I'm not going to waste too much time and I'm just going to get into some of this identification uh, of these. And so I, I did these, uh, no, I didn't do iguanas, <laughs> sorry. sorry. Um, we, could, we could put iguanas as the other category, uh, lizards, I suppose. Um, we can talk about that at the end. Uh, so for caterpillars, um, I want to mention, you can see I have order Lepidoptera. Um, I did put the orders on here just so you guys can kind of get an idea or a sense of how these insects might be related. So that's, that's why I have that on here. Um, so keep in mind our caterpillars are our immature uh, butterflies and moths. So, um, you know, while, while they are damaging as caterpillars uh, in the larval stage, we typically like them in the, the adult stage, which is the butterfly and moth stage, particularly if it's something that is a pollinator. And some of our moths, um, and of course butterflies, uh, do help pollinate plants. So. Again, you, you got to keep that in mind um, when we're balancing this. So I want to start off with our hornworms. Okay, uh, these are fairly popular in gardens, uh, I will tell you. Um, and so we've got our tobacco hornworm. I've got several, sorry, I've got several people emailing me about the, um, the ID for this class. Um, Maxine, will you go on the Facebook page for me and put in the ID number for the, the Zoom? Um, it's at the top. Okay. Uh, so, so, sorry about that. Going back to the, um, the hornworms here. So there's actually two different kinds um, in Florida that, that people don't realize. Um, and typically, you know, we call everything a tomato hornworm. Um, typically, you're, you're going to see actually the tobacco hornworm in Florida more than the tomato hornworm. But I wanted to show you the difference because it's very subtle. Um, and honestly, in the end, the damage is the same. So they're still gonna strip the plant of leaves. They're still gonna eat the tomato plant. Um, and they really will eat anything in that Solanaceae family. So you're thinking, um, you know, if you, if you do happen to grow things like tobacco or um, the flowering nicotina, uh, if you do, um, you know, they will get on things like peppers, eggplants, but they love tomatoes. So let's just look at these here. Um, you can see, let's look at tomato hornworm first. So that, I call these juicy caterpillars. They are fairly, um, it's a technical term, a juicy caterpillar, okay? They're very robust uh, and um, they're green, okay, bright green, both of them are. But if you notice on the tomato hornworm, it has a, a yellow stripe, but it actually uh, makes a V-shaped. So it's kind of a sideways V. Uh, and then if you look at that little horn on the back, which is why we get the name hornworm. Um, on the tomato hornworm, it's going to be black. Okay, and that's it's it's a dark color. Versus on the tobacco hornworm, it does not have that V shape. It just has that stripe, okay, that yellow stripe, and then it has a a uh, red horn. So you can kind of see that there. Okay. Uh, on the adults. 
that is the moth of both of those caterpillars. So it is a, we consider it a sphinx moth. Um, and the, you, the, really the only way to tell the difference is if you look at those orange spots down that um, abdomen there on the uh, tomato hornworm, you're gonna see five. As you can count them, there's five sets. Okay. On the tobacco hornworm, there's six sets. But you can kind of see that sixth set is very tricky um, to, to find, okay? Uh, so it's a little bit difficult to see, but there are actually six. So if you are collecting moths for some reason um, and you want to ID it, that would be a good way to do that. But these are fairly large moths. Um, there are several inches across. Um, and again, we call them the sphinx moth. Now, if you see a um, tobacco or tomato hornworm, and you see this middle picture here with the white, uh, they look like little um, almost cigar shaped um, projections on the back. Those are actually um, eggs, okay? So that is an egg uh, from a wasp that the wasp actually is parasitic. And so you wouldn't wanna kill this caterpillar because he's, he's basically a living mummy at this point but the wasp will inject the eggs into this caterpillar. Uh, the eggs will hatch um, in the caterpillar. And once they're ready to pupate, the wasps, once they're ready to pupate, they actually spin this little cocoon where they're gonna pupate on the back of this caterpillar. And this caterpillar just kind of moves it from place to place. And then you'll see when they're ready to, to merge, they'll pop out the top and there'll be a little hole in the top where the wasp has flown out. Um, and this is not a wasp that's going to sting you or anything. It's just, um, you, it looks like a gnat to us. It's about the size of a gnat. Um, but pretty cool um, biological control going on there. So you wouldn't want to mess with that one. I will give you control options for all of these at the end. Um, I will tell you the easiest way to get rid of these is to pick them off with your hand. Okay. But I'll go through it, them all at the end. Okay. So army worms, um, another big problem right now, especially if you have, um, if your potatoes are still going, uh, they tend to like things like crabgrass as well. So a lot of times we'll see them growing on uh, or starting on crabgrass before they move to everything else in your yard, um, not just your garden. There are several different kinds of army worms. Um, there's a southern army worm, there's a western one, um, but they all kind of look the same, okay? Uh, and I'm not going to get too detailed here, but you're looking for this red, we call it a head cap, a red head cap. Uh, you can see the picture there. These happen to be from my garden. Um, you're looking for that red head cap, and then most of them have yellow stripes, the caterpillars, down their sides. Some of them will be a browner color and have an inverted Y on the back of their head. So it, it actually is a Y that comes off that red cap and kind of down its back a little bit. Uh, Again, a juicy caterpillar, but not nearly the size of um, the tobacco hornworm or the tomato hornworm, okay? These are probably an inch, uh, give or take, um, depending on the species. But you can see the damage compared to a hornworm. The damage is typically gonna be a little bit more holes, um, and we would call that like window feeding. Um, you can find these when they're babies, when they first hatch, they typically hatch in uh, 30 to 40, if not more. Some of our army worms can have up to 300 in an egg casing, which is like a, it looks like a white little fluffy, um, kind of has, a, looks like cotton almost. Um, so that can be several hundred in, a, in an egg casing. Um, but you can actually, in this picture on the left, you can see the little baby caterpillars kind of peeking out. But if you, if you notice that, you can flip it over and either remove them and squish them or just take that leaf off and get them all at once. Um, so really, it's best to get them little. Um, and the threshold on these, I will tell you, um, it's, it's, you need to be careful because if you have three in a garden, armyworms can, can really move through very, very quickly. So um, we have a much lower threshold than say if it was a, a, a hornworm. Um, you know, you're gonna find one or two hornworms where you might find 50 armyworms and they will eat everything. So another one I, I noticed you guys have been having problems with, and this one frustrates me because they, they, it annoys me because it just comes in the garden, it cuts something off, but it doesn't actually eat it. 
which just really makes me mad because I feel like if you're gonna if you're gonna be there, you might as well eat the plant. Um, but this one just kind of leaves it and says, "Ha, ha I ate your plant, and here's here's you know the remnants of it." Um, so cutworms are gonna come out at night, so you're not gonna see them normally. Uh, you can see this is the adult here on the upper right hand corner. Not a very pretty moth. Uh, you probably won't notice it. It's going to be, you know, an inch, inch and a half, somewhere in there. Okay. Um, so not, not very pretty at all. And just brown. So it, it looks like a lot of other things that we have in the yard, unfortunately. Um, you can see there's a couple different kind of cutworms. There's black and there's granulated that you're going to deal with mostly. Usually they're on um, things like corn. Okay, you can see here. Um, I've got them on baby tomatoes, baby peppers. Uh, they'll, they'll go for beans. Um, but again, you can see where he's cut it and then it just kind of flops over. Uh, I did read and, and I would be interesting if anybody's tried this before, I meant to look into this more. I was reading where if you have little cups with um, screens on the bottom and you put it around the plant, they can't climb up and cut it. Uh, but I've never tried that and I meant to look into it more. So if you're having a problem with cutworms, you might wanna look into that. Um, it was kind of an interesting uh, thought that, that I was reading about. But you can see these are um, have this brown stripe. They're kind of a grayish color. You're gonna have to look early in the morning for these um, because uh, and, you, and you typically you'll want to kind of um, take your hand and push the soil away and see if you can find them right at the base. Because again, during the day, they're going to be kind of curled up in a C shape in the soil. Okay, uh, but they are very frustrating or take a flashlight out at, at night and see if you can find them. Okay. Uh, and then another one that we're dealing with right now are leaf rollers. Um, so typically we see bean leaf rollers, although we've had, um, I've had some webworms on my tomatoes as well. Um, and so this is, I just wanted to show you what a, a bean leaf roller looks like. So it has this very dark head cap, okay? And it's a, it's a pretty green color. Now, these are pretty small. I would say half an inch, three quarters, maybe up to an inch, um, but not likely, okay? And they're going to do the leaf damage. You can see the feeding there. Um, and then they'll curl over that leaf and it's, it's a webbing that they use to, to make it stick. And that's where they're going to complete their life cycle, pupate, and then emerge. Um, and they will emerge as a skipper. Okay. You would typically know it as a skipper. So I honestly love these in the garden. Um, and so I typically will sacrifice some of my bean leaves because I don't, you know, they don't usually do such a damage, um, but I like skippers, so, uh, and they are, um, you know, good on our, our, for our plants and whatnot. So I, again, I, I don't typically control the bean rollers too much. Um, I try and keep them in check, but, but I do leave a few just to, just to have the skippers around, but um, it's a unique little, uh, it's in the butterfly family, obviously, so. All right, any questions on caterpillars? I'll give it a minute. And again, I will go over control. For you. Okay. Seeing none, I'm going to move on to um, hemiptras. So the order hemiptera includes all of our true bugs and then also what we used to call hemoptras, um, which is now a family underneath uh, hemiptera. And those are all of our piercing sucking insects. So these guys are all gonna have a piercing sucking mouth part uh, that typically injects into the plant or the fruit and is going to be sucking out the juices, okay? Uh, so this guy here, you can see in this picture, this is an, actually an oak tree hopper. So he's not necessarily a garden pest, but he's a beautiful insect. So, um, and he is a hemiptera. So that's why I included him. So let's talk about aphids, whiteflies, and thrips, okay? And again, thrips, they get thrown in with this class. Um, I actually have pulled it out into another order because it, it's, they're technically not related to these insects. But, um, so I'll focus on aphids and whiteflies first. So the picture on the left-hand side, those are aphids. Um, if you don't have aphids in your garden, you probably will at some point. 
Uh, and I challenge you to go find and look through your garden and see if you can find one because I bet you probably have them. Um, they love squash, the backsides, the leaves. Um, you're gonna find these on the new growth. So right at the tip of the plant, you're gonna look at the underside of the plant at the leaves, okay? Um, and the damage that they're doing typically makes the plant either curl. So you might see distortion. You might see some bronzing, which means the leaf turns a little bit silver color. You might see, um, I'm trying to think what else. Oh, they do carry viruses. So um, we'll talk about that in just a second. But um, they carry a couple of tomato viruses, um, some squash viruses, depending on which one you have. So depending on which aphid you have, I mean. Uh, and keep in mind, aphids come in different colors. So you might see a gray one, you might see an orange one, you might see a pink one. Um, some are kind of purpley. So a lot of them tend to be, um, I don't want to say host specific, but they, there are certain ones that prefer um, certain plants. So there's a crepe myrtle aphid, for instance. Okay. Um, if you grow a milkweed for your monarchs, you're going to have the milkweed aphid on there. Okay. Um, just kind of one of those things. But the way to tell if it's an aphid is to look at the back of its abdomen. And you can, you can kind of see on some of these on the left-hand side, if you look closely, they have something called cornicles. And they're these two little projections, okay, right on the back end of it. They look like legs in the picture, but they're these little black things that just stick up. Um, that's the best way to tell if it's an aphid, okay? It's a, a juicy little insect and it has to have those two cornicles. You might see some with wings because they do fly, okay? Some of them fly um, and that's, that's normal, but they're all gonna have cornicles, okay? So that's the best way to tell if it is an aphid. You might see some of them that are brown, which kind of look like these are, are here. So they're, they're a different color, okay? Those have been, we call them um, aphid mummies, okay? They've been parasitized, again, by like a little wasp. And what'll happen is, is uh, similar to the caterpillar, there's an insect developing in there. When it's ready to emerge, it will cut out a perfect circle and then pop out the backside. So I try and, and monitor the aphid populations. If I see a lot of that going on, where I have a lot of brown ones with holes in their backs, I don't typically treat the, the aphids at that point, or I might just take my finger and squish some of them um, to reduce the population or take some soapy water and, and kind of rinse it off. Um, hose is another good thing. If you take a strong hose and just blow them off, that helps. Uh, but, but if I have a good population of mummies, I'll leave it alone. The other thing that I should have put on here and I, I didn't and I apologize, is I look for ladybug larvae so they don't look like the lady beetles, okay, or the adult um, lady, they're lady, we call it ladybugs, but they're typically, or technically not, but it's a beetle. Um, they look very strange, okay, but their favorite meal is an aphid. So I, I look for those because if they're around, you don't obviously want to treat, they're already taking care of your problem for you, okay. On the right-hand side, we have white flies. Now, I know somebody mentioned they have spiraling whitefly, and um, while they're very damaging, um, I have to admit they're one of my favorites because it has such a cool pattern. Um, a lot of whiteflies will have, we call it flocculence. So again, it's kind of a white cottony substance, but the spiraling will actually create a spiral out of it. So it's pretty easy to identify, um, but they can be quite damaging. And, and uh, South Florida has some major whitefly issues. Um, Luckily in North Florida, they're not nearly as bad, but they certainly will do damage on your plants. So you might start to see like your, um, your squash leaves, for instance, turning kind of a silvery color. Check the underside and, and these are hard to see again because they, they kind of fly. So we're talking less than a quarter of an inch here. So they're very tiny, um, more like a 10th of an inch somewhere in there. Uh, so you kind of have to hit it and then watch and see if something flies away. When they're babies, and you can see there's actually babies here on here, um, those are those flat things, okay? They look like scale. That, oops, that is an immature uh, white fly. And if you look at it under a microscope, 
um, for those of you that may be master gardeners um, and identifying this stuff later, if you don't have the adults present, it actually, um, and you just have the babies present, it looks like a zipper. So, so when they're ready to emerge, it unzips down the middle and then they pop out. So a scale will never do that, um, but a white fly will. And if, you, if it hasn't emerged yet, you can actually see usually the eyeballs in there and it, you can see it looking at you. So it's kind of cool, um, but very, very, um, or they can be very damaging. And again, it's gonna be a similar uh, control to aphids where we're looking at um, our soaps, our oils. Uh, and then for these in particular, if I know I'm gonna have a problem or I think I'm gonna have a problem, um, you can use things like reflective mulch will help. Um, also, uh, a lot of times I use like pie plates. I'll hang those nearby. And, and these, what, what it's doing is it's, it's messing up um, their, I'm trying to think what the term would be, but they're basically their navigation system, okay? Um, because they see it's reflecting, they think that's a sun, so they fly the other direction. So it kind of messes up uh, their direction as far as, not a pipe light, a, a pie plate. Like a like an aluminum pie plate, Do they, or or aluminum foil would work as well. Okay. So some of the damage that white fly um, can cause is uh, tomato leaf curl virus, and so you do want to make sure that you're monitoring, particularly your um, tomatoes. Okay. Uh, also, uh, if you see this in peppers. Um, as well, any of your solanaceous crops, okay? So you can see that the, the tomato plant does not look right. It looks like it's curled. It's kind of, um, the leaves are thicker maybe than it might normally be. Uh, they're a little bit yellow. Uh, so as a gardener, you would say, you know, my, there's something wrong with this plant. It almost looks like it has been um, sprayed with herbicides, okay? Uh, which, which, you know, we always consider that as well if you're trying to decipher what's going on. But if you know you've had uh, insects like white flies, again, they're piercing sucking insects. So they have a mouth part where they're sticking it in to plant. And every time they, they use it, it's like a straw, they suck up those juices. And then when they go to the next plant, they actually spit a little bit out of the last plant. So that's how it's transmitted is through that fluid in that white fly. I just wanted to show you some of the damage that you might see on something like a tomato um, from white flies. So the one in the upper left hand corner would be um, a normal ripening tomato. Okay, that's the way it's supposed to be ripening. Then you have progressive stages. So the one on the upper right hand corner, you can see um, this had minimal feeding, but it's starting to have a little bit of yellowing at the base. The bottom left hand corner, you're seeing more yellowing. And, and what you're seeing is um, it's not ripening all at the same time. Okay, that's what it's looking like. Uh, and then that bottom uh, right hand corner uh, is that, that one that's had the most damage. And so you're seeing again um, where it's not ripening because you were getting a lot of that feeding damage. Um, and it does stress that plant out. So we do want to monitor for white flies because it can damage your crop, okay. For stink bugs, um, this is one that, that I think everybody is dealing with, whether you see green stink bugs or you might see brown stink bugs, okay. Um, I doubt we have anybody on the call that has marmorated, brown marmorated stink bugs. Um, that's an, a new invasive species that we shouldn't have here, but you're gonna see the regular Florida green southern stink bug or the brown one. And this is what they look like, okay? I think everybody's probably familiar with those. Again, a piercing sucking mouth part. So it's gonna actually feed on the um, tissue or the fruits. And these do do some damage to your fruit, um, actually quite a, quite a bit. Uh, if you are trying to figure out how to trap them, sunflowers are one of your best methods. Um, we have discovered though, uh, and this is something that I even do that I need to stop doing. I like to plant flowers in the garden. So I tend to put my sunflowers amongst my crops. Um, with our research, we've, we've really decided that's probably not the best idea because you're really just attracting 
the stink bugs and the leaf footed bugs like into the garden. So plant those on the outside of the garden so that they're, they're being attracted away. You can still enjoy them, but they're not in the garden. Um, so a couple things I wanted to point out, these guys go through several um, instars. So they actually will molt uh, and they go through about five. And so they're actually quite beautiful. Um, and you're probably seeing this right now. Uh, those in South Florida, um, you've probably already passed this point, uh, or you have multiple generations per year, okay? Whereas in Northern Florida, you're not gonna see them all the time. You'll get a little bit of a break. Um, but in South Florida, they certainly are out probably all the time. Um, but I wanted to draw your attention to the fact that they don't look the same, okay? when they're babies versus adults. So this happens to be this one in the upper right hand corner. That's around a fourth in star, uh, and that's a green stink bug. So even when they go from a second to a third to a fourth to a fifth, the color changes. So they look very, very different. Um, and so just be aware of that, that you might see them as a beautiful, colorful little bug right now. Uh, but they are actually a stink bug, okay? So get them when they're little. Uh, let's see. Somebody said elderberry uh, tracks makes a great trap crop. Well, that's, that makes me feel great because my entire house has elderberry around it. <laughs> so I should collect some great stink bugs this year. Um, maybe they won't come to my garden. I also want to point out, and, and um, I don't want to say it's a myth, but, but a lot of gardeners will say, um, now there's, there's predatory stink bugs. So good guys, okay? And, and gardeners will say, look at their, we call this a pronotum, okay? The back, of the, the back of the shoulders. If you look at their shoulders, if it's pointy, that's typically a predaceous stink bug, meaning it eats other bugs, okay? So it's a good guy. If it's more rounded, it's usually a bad stink bug. That works in most cases, but there are some brown stink bugs that do have um, some, some sharp shoulders uh, that are not good. So the best way to tell is looking at their mouth part, okay? So if you are comfortable, you know, if you're collecting one or whatever and you wanna know, um, look at their mouth parts. So on the, the picture here where we see three pinned insects, okay? Uh, the one on the left, you can see that, that thing that's kind of sticking up that's his mouth part. It looks like a straw, okay? So it looks like it's attached right as, at his nose, at the very tip of his head. That is a plant eating, okay, or a bad stink bug. The one on the right is your predaceous stink bug. So you can see where it does have a gap between its body and its mouth part, but it's attached farther down on its, on its head, okay? Um, so you can kind of tell the difference there. And again, that's, that's the best way to tell if you're really struggling with wanting to know if they're good or bad and you have several, okay. One that we see a lot, and I find this one very interesting, is your leaf-footed plant bug, okay. Um, he's a very large bug. Uh, he gets to a couple inches typically, but we call it a leaf-footed plant bug because it has these um, projections on their hind legs here. So you can see it's flat, okay? The problem is if they're babies in your garden, and you can see these two pictures I have here, the babies look just like baby assassin bugs. And nature probably did this on purpose. Um, but the way to tell is that top picture is a baby leaf-footed plant bug, okay? And if you look at the femur on that, which is the back leg, okay, if you look at the back leg, you can kind of see it's starting to get a little bit flattened. So it's a little bit, it's getting a little bit wide. Everybody see that? On the bottom picture, that, that is our assassin bug. That is your good bug that eats scale and all, you know, aphids, all kind of other bugs. You do not want to kill those, okay? But look at the hind legs. See how straight those are? Okay, There's, they're not gonna be projected at all. He doesn't look like he has thick legs. Um, that's a good guy. But they're very, very hard to tell the difference at this stage. And at least in North Florida right now, we're seeing both at the same time. 
So this is one I'm always very careful um, before I collect everybody. You know, if I find a whole group of them, I check before I collect them or, or control them because it might be a, a group of good guys. Um, so I wanted to draw that attention. Okay. Any questions on the hemiptras? Not yet. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about thrips. Um, and again, this is in a different order, but we tend to think of them in, a, in the same group as our um, aphids and whiteflies. So thrips are, gosh, they're tiny, okay? They're really, really small. Um, it's, if you have it on your skin, you're gonna, you're, you're gonna look like, or if you look at it, it you can barely see it, okay? Um, I will tell you these, <laughs> They don't bite, but the interesting thing with thrips is they have a rasping mouth part. Okay, that's rasping. So it actually, when it gets a leaf, it takes its mouth part and it rubs. Okay, it rasps on it. And it creates this, this juice and then it will suck up the juice. So that's why it's in a different order than say our um, hemipteras, which have a piercing sucking mouth part. The damage does look very similar. Um, and I will tell you, uh, these, there's, gosh, there's probably five, 10 different kinds that you might encounter, um, different species. But uh, if you're finding that you're being bitten by something outside right now and you can't see what it is, um, a lot of people will call them noceums, but noceums only exist at the beach, okay? They're thrips. And so they're falling from the, the they live in flowers. These are flower thrips. They're falling from our oak trees right now. If you have any kind of flowering plant that's taller than you are, they'll fall down on you and get on your skin and, and bite. Um, and they're not really biting, they're rasping on your skin. So um, just fun fact. So thrips damage, um, we have chili thrips. We have, um, this is a flower thrip right here that you're seeing, um, but again, small. The best way to monitor for these is to take a white piece of paper Go outside your leaf and hit the leaf, okay, and see what falls on that piece of paper. That's usually the, the, a great way to find these if you don't have a microscope, okay. But you can see some of the damage. Um, if you get enough of them, it will cause like a bronzing effect. So that's what you're seeing on those strawberries there is that, that bronzing color. Um, sometimes on things like peppers, you'll get a, it almost looks like a corky. Okay, like, it, like the, the tissue is turned brown and kind of corky. Uh, you'll see that happen, okay. On the plants, you might see, again, that silver coloring. You might see um, distortion. Uh, you might see yellowing. Uh, they do carry viruses, okay, or transmit viruses. So again, this is um, to tomato spot wilt virus uh, on, the, on a pepper, okay. And you're looking for that kind of strange growth. And if you see that, um, really it's, it's best just to remove that plant so that it's, it's not a, a host or inoculant for, for other uh, you know, viruses or insects to come in. But that's kind of the damage that they do. Um, and, and these are throughout the state, throughout the United States. Um, so you'll see those no matter where you are. Um, and thrips, again, are tiny, but um, can pose some serious damage. All right, now we're gonna to move to beetles. And I'm gonna point out just a few of, for beetles. Um, I'm not gonna to take too much time on these guys, but I did add grubs in because grubs are baby beetles, they're immature beetles. So these are just a few that I know from our Victory Garden Facebook page that you guys are seeing, okay? So I'll start in the upper right-hand corner. Um, that is a flea beetle, okay, and there are quite a few different kinds, um, but uh, it's in the family Chrysomilidae. So they, they're kind of small, about a quarter of an inch. This one is a jewel color. Uh, and so I know they're, they're very active. I've got them at my house as well. Um, and they will put little tiny holes in your plants. So it looks kind of like baby caterpillar damage. Okay, but this is your flea beetles that are, that are doing these. Um, and so control is a little bit difficult because you have to control typically um, the larval stage. The adult stage is a little bit, um, again, more difficult because you know, you're not gonna put a broadcast 
insecticide out um, typically for these. So, and I'll talk about control in a minute. But two others I wanted to point out are flower beetles that you're seeing right now. Um, and so the flower beetles, these are two different kinds um, that you're seeing here. Generally the one in the middle you'll see, and these are maybe half an inch, not even, um, three quarters of an inch. Uh, they, usually you see that their rear end actually is usually all you find, stuck in a flower somewhere. So um, they're important for pollination of different, different plants. They really don't do damage in the garden, they're just there. So I wanted to point them out. Um, we get the question or people think that they're Japanese beetles. We don't have Japanese beetles in Florida. And if you think you have a Japanese beetle in your garden, please call your extension agent and, and collect it for us. <laughs> um, because that's always one, especially if you're in, in North uh, Florida, um, people think they have, but um, it has not been identified here. So um, again, contact us and, and let us know. Uh, there are several that look just like it, okay? And that Japanese beetle does horrific damage, so we keep an eye out for it, okay? Somebody said possibly they might have them. So again, send us some pictures. You can, you can private message us and send them to us, um, and then we will probably ask you for samples. Um, I can't see why we wouldn't, okay? But we want to make sure that you guys understand that the grub is that immature stage of that beetle. So I know um, a lot of people are finding these large grubs in their garden, especially when you plow or you till, uh, you might find them, okay? Uh, and they have a red head cap. Typically they're gonna have, um, if it's a, a, a grub beetle, it'll have the six legs there. Um, the thing is, is, is if you show me that, that larvae, I can't tell you for certainty which beetle it belongs to. Um, I actually would have to take it back to the a microscope and look at the rasters, uh, which is the hairs on its um, posterior end. So basically the hairs on its, its butt, okay? Um, there's different patterns that they come in and that tells me which adult beetle it will turn into. And so your options normally are these beautiful June beetles that we have pictured here, okay? That's the most likely. Um, it could be an ox beetle, which is the one with the, the rhino beetle with the big horns. Um, and sometimes they're masked chafer beetles, which are a, a little bit lighter brown color. Um, but normally they're these June beetles, and this is just a couple different colors here, different kinds. Um, these grubs get, oh, several inches. Um, I have been told that chickens really like them. So if you are a homesteader or you have chickens, you can, can do that. Um, one of the best control methods is that plowing. Um, because you're disturbing their area and you're, you're finding them. Um, just know that 70% of our native pollinators are ground dwelling. So, you know, I struggle with that myself is, okay, well, I'm plowing up for my garden, but I want the native pollinators, but I just destroyed their house. <laughs> so, you know, it's a give and take um, how you decide to, to do, if you do no-till or, or till or raised beds, okay. Um, now keep in mind these grubs are, it's interesting, they typically are on a three year cycle, meaning every three years you see the worst. So I'm hoping this is a really bad year because I have found a lot of grubs, um, extensive numbers of grubs this year. Uh, and so in the research it says, okay, well you should have two years where they're, they're less, they're not gonna go away, but they're, they're less, and then you'll pick up on that third year. So, um, and these do, you know, the life cycle is pretty long, so. Yeah, somebody said they had minor bees this year, which is great. I mean, any of those, any of those native um, pollinators are fantastic. All right, so I'm gonna move on to mites um, because I want you to make sure you're looking for these in your garden. Uh, and we had somebody ask about their squash leaves the other day. Um, this is pretty typical damage to plants, okay, from mites. Um, and spider mites are, are the one you're probably gonna see the most of right now throughout the state, Not, doesn't matter where you are. They like hot uh, and dry, okay? So um, they're called spider mites because they have that webbing that goes with them. Um, and they're pretty hairy if you, if you do get to look at them under a microscope. Uh, if you see enough of them, um, I had some on my elderberry the other day, you don't need a microscope to see these. They look like baby spiders um, because they'll get enough webbing on there 
and then it, it's just the size of a pencil tip um, is what you're seeing the little dots those are our mites um, but to check for them again take a, a white piece of paper and hit the bottom of your your leaf on there and see if you can see them kind of scatter um, there are a lot of predatory mites as, as well but your predatory mites are going to be if you see them under a microscope pretty quick or if you see them on a piece of paper they actually run really fast versus spider mites which are much slower uh, insects but this is the damage you're going to see that that stippling damage um, that silver color uh, similar again to white flies um, because they do have piercing sucking mouth parts um, just keep in mind that mites typically or not typically but they are related to spiders they have eight legs okay um, when there are babies in the crawler stage you can find them with six six legs though uh, some species so just keep that in mind if you're a master gardener and identifying those okay uh, and then grasshoppers and katydids and if you guys remind me i'll do leaf miners too okay so for our grasshoppers and katydids there's like two that you really need to be aware of and i'm pretty sure most of you know about these um, just from our conversation earlier uh, this is that lubber grasshopper okay anybody not have lubbers if you don't have lubbers um, you're you're lucky um, it's interesting because they they tend to show up in pockets like you'll see one property that that they're at and then they'll be the next door neighbor and they're never over there so um, you would know because these the adults get ooh, four inches or so in size okay so you really have to control them at the immature stage which is that that black little grasshopper on the right so that's the immature um, of the adult lubber so you you in what you'll see is you'll they'll kind of when they hatch or emerge um, they'll kind of stay together as a group you need to get them then okay whether you're doing it in the yard and chasing them around or they're on a, if you can get them on a leaf, um, they typically go to things like lilies, like crinum lilies first, um, and then they'll end up eating other things in your garden uh, or your yard, okay? But try and get them when they're little um, because most animals like birds and things just don't really like them when they're big. So they, they just don't do a lot um, with them at that point. Um, I get a bucket with rubbing alcohol in it and, and throw them in the bucket. I can't squish them myself, uh, but that's certainly an option. Um, I just, I can't do it. So, oh, where did my Katie dids go? Oh, I'll talk about her here. Okay, so this is a Katie did, okay, in the front picture here. Um, and so most of the Katie dids, if you're in North Florida, they're actually emerging right now and they're, they're small, they have really long antenna and they're very, very colorful. Um, but Katie did love citrus. So if you have citrus around, um, you tend to find the Katie dids and they look just like a leaf. Um, just know they will come in brown and they'll come in green. Okay, so, so both, both colors, um, you might find them. Uh, other than eating, you know, your leaves are fairly harmless. Um, the eggs, if you see it on a citrus especially, they're, they're brown and they kind of, they look like little shields and they overlap right on the edge of a leaf. Um, and again, usually it's things like a citrus leaf that they're going to get on first, um, which happens to be what these lubbers are sitting on. Um, and these guys, when you're looking for damage, you're looking for huge chunks removed. You can almost see where they've, they've eaten their mouth parts. They do have a chewing mouth part like a beetle would. So they're eating large sections. And so you'll, you'll have large holes on the sides of the leaf. Um, rarely would you see the middle of the leaf eaten by these. It's too difficult for them. So that would be something else, okay? If the leaves are stripped, that's something else. Um, these are gonna eat just, like I said, holes on the sides. And so we do use how, how these things eat um, to identify them. Um, I do wanna talk about leaf miners before I move on real quick. Um, we do get that question a lot and i didn't think about it but but leaf miners are uh there's a couple different kinds most of you are probably dealing with a serpentine leaf miner which means if you have a tomato leaf you'll see a little line that goes through it or if you have a citrus leaf you'll see a little line that goes through it okay um, there's also a splotch leaf miner and a blotch leaf miner uh, and there's a couple others but but again serpentine is what you're going to see uh, most likely and so what that is, it's a little, um, usually it's a wasp or a gnat, but it's a very small insect. 
and it, it will actually um, lay an egg in the leaf and it's in between the leaf tissue. So it's, it's a very small area. That, that larvae will then um, hatch and it's tunneling its way through the leaf. So that's why you get that serpentine pattern. It's, it's eating the inside of that leaf tissue. Then when it gets um, ready to emerge, it will go to, kind of go to the end. You can usually find a little point where it stopped and then it, it emerged. Okay, so it's very difficult to control those other than just pulling the leaf off. Um, and, and they do mostly aesthetic damage. Um, so I don't even bother controlling, but we, we do, I don't recommend systemic products in our gardens typically. So uh, somebody asked what would eat large round holes in the center of the leaves. Um, I would like to see the, the how it was done. So, um, not have any teeth marks that you could see, okay? Because um, I think I think mammals, I think um, caterpillars. Uh, I also have to check for diseases because I think there's a few fungal diseases that we call shot shot corn or shot holes. They'll have little holes that look like something ate it, but didn't actually. Somebody said we can't hear you very well. You might want to try turning your volume up. I think mine's at max. Better? Okay. Um, so mammals is gonna be our last group. Um, and so I've put deer, bunnies, moles, and squirrels and rats on here because I know that that's what you guys have been dealing with, okay? So if you have a plant that um, really has the leaves stripped off of it, um, that's what's gonna be deer. They, they don't have those upper incisors. So they're, they're taking their tongue and they're ripping the leaves off. They're stripping the leaves off. And normally it's six feet and under, okay? Um, if it's a bunny rabbit or something like a squirrel or a rat or even something like a raccoon, um, they're gonna bite it clean and then, and then take it, okay? Um, so it's gonna be a much larger hole and typically you're not left with anything. So uh, your moles and your voles, really you're looking for underground tunnels. And they're about the size of, of my hand, a couple. It's going to be a couple inches across underneath the ground. And that's where you're going to find those moles or voles. Uh, and it's, it looks like a little rodent, OK? So if we can control for these, um, I'll be honest, it's very difficult, OK, in most cases. Um, if you don't have a dog that's out all the time, um, if you don't have access to fences. Um, now, of course, every situation is different. So if you're dealing with deer, um, you know, we look at, okay, what, what else is around? Are they, why else are they being attracted? Are there no other food sources? Um, do I want to put money into a fence? Uh, typically for a deer fence, you're talking about a very, very tall fence, okay? Which if you're in an area, there's some areas that that's not going to work, okay? Or you don't want an eight, 10 foot tall fence in your, your yard. Um, you can look at electric fences uh, where you, you do the electric fences and then the deer just get used to it and they know it's on electric and you just turn it on intermittently, that sometimes helps. Um, you can have automatic irrigation where, where it, it's motion censored almost. Um, people have used the noise makers, okay? <laughs> Excuse me. Um, a couple of good ones I, I think um, are food plots or considering if, if you have the property for it, uh, putting in a food plot in a different area. And that's specifically for the deer. So planting um, items that they would find maybe more desirable than your garden and hoping that you're stopping them before they get there. But again, it depends on how the property is set up, okay? Um, for littler, um, like squirrels, bunnies, rats, uh, increasing the predators is your best shot, uh, I think. Um, so things, if you, if you are able to do it, increasing things like um, birdhouses, okay, or cover for the birds. Um, if you're in an urban area, that's obviously very difficult, okay? And then we have to consider some other things. I will tell you, we typically don't recommend baits um, and rodenticides. If you've got some kind of burrowing animal, uh, they make me very nervous uh, because most people don't use them correctly. Uh, you also have to think about secondary kill. And what that means is, is if uh, a rat eats the bait, what eats the rat, okay? Um, typically it's some kind of predatory bird. So we, we don't want to keep that chain going um, 
And, and then again, you know, I always worry about uh, the family dog finding it or kids finding it um, because most people, again, don't use it correctly. Mothballs is another one that is not labeled for outdoor pesticide use. Um, it is labeled for indoor pesticide use typically. Okay, so um, that's a, 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 another one that's, you're basically just putting out pesticides in the environment. So it's a, it's a tough one. I'm not gonna lie to deal with some of these mammals, um, but you know, work with, work with us, work with your extension agents so that we can maybe walk you through some options um, and, and really it's how far are you willing to take it um, and, and fencing out your, your stuff. So I wanna talk about prevention options. I've, I'm right at time, so I'm gonna, gonna leave you with this stuff. And keep in mind, we will give you these PowerPoints. It will be up uh, on our, our website. We're going through and putting all of these on YouTube for you. But some prevention options um, that I want you to consider uh, for things like grubs, uh, crop rotation, okay? Also for some of your other insects, your beetles and whatnot, your, um, knowing if you plant the same thing in the same spot every single year, they're gonna have a really nice life cycle going on, okay? Think about traps. So this is for monitoring. We can get those yellow sticky cards. Okay, you can make your own if you want. Um, there's also pheromone traps, depending on what, what beetle you're dealing with, for instance, uh, or caterpillar, okay? Well, we have pheromone traps for the moths. And so these hang usually in the garden and will attract the pest you can kind of tell what's there. Um, the sticky cards, if they're yellow, tend to get a lot of white flies, aphids, thrips. Okay. Uh, consider companion planting. So um, making sure that you've got some, some options for your plants, making them happy. Uh, you might consider banker or trap crops. And so a trap crop, again, it, I mentioned the sunflowers earlier. Um, crepe myrtles is another one that will and what a trap crop is, it's a plant that you're planting and you purposely want the insects to go to it, the bad ones, okay? You can use it for two different ways. You can have the, the um, pest go there and then if you choose to spray, you can spray just that area, okay? And you're really knocking back the populations. It also um, may be a site where you have a large population of pests, but now you're getting a large population of predators that can stay. In that case, you wouldn't probably uh, spray or treat, but you've now got a food source, an ongoing food source for these predators. Um, because that's a lot of times our problem is we'll get predators in, but then they eat everything and then they go to the neighbor's house, okay, or somewhere else. Uh, and then planting for beneficials, uh, because again, beneficials uh, are going to outcompete our pest uh, in a lot of cases. So things like buckwheat um, can attract those. And they don't have to be in your garden. You can do a little swath on the side. Okay. And so there's a lot of different options for that. Okay, so when we're considering control options, I'm finishing up here. Um, I wanna do the less risky pest control option first. Okay. And if you ever have a question about that, just ask us. Okay. So um, I'm gonna look at the least uh, chemical option first. Then if I am gonna do chemical option, can I target it? So not blanketing it in the whole area. And is there a mechanical control I can do? Okay. Um, rarely am I gonna do broadcast sprays of non-specific insecticide, meaning I'm just gonna go out there with seven dust and put it everywhere. Um, not the best idea, <laughs> okay? So uh, this one I think you'll find helpful. I've got this slide and the next slide where I went through the insect and then I gave you options. Okay, so again, these will be available to you. But for, I did non-chemical options, um, which is what we would prefer you start with, uh, and then your low risk. So these are um, insecticides, okay? They are pesticides, but they're your lower risk options. And then your high risk options, which um, again, these are ones I would, would caution you use to use. Um, try everything else first. So um, caterpillar, most of the stuff, caterpillars, uh, stink bugs, you can pick them off, okay? And just have a bucket of either soapy water or rubbing alcohol and put them in there. Um, you can use trap crops for your caterpillars. If you wanna use low risk, you can look at something like BT, which is Bacillus thuringiensis. Depends on your garden though, okay? If your garden is one where you are, um, 
having your butterfly plants mixed in your vegetable garden, um, which is something I tend to do, you may want to not use the, the BT because it, it can drift a little bit depending on what you're using. Um, so you have to be careful. It'll, it doesn't discriminate against bad caterpillars versus good caterpillars. Okay. Um, spinosad is a, a we consider a low risk pesticide. Um, some of your pyrethrins. Uh, for your things like mites, your aphids, white flies, thrips, neem oil, your insecticidal soap. Okay. Um, and you notice I put insecticidal soap. Uh, this is something you would purchase. It has a label. Okay. So it tells you the rate. Um, if you choose to make your own, that's fine. Um, obviously, we don't have the research on that, um, and you can can Google that uh, for those those recipes. Uh, let's see. I did have a question come up, and then I wanted to, to just put these out here. Fire ants I didn't get to talk about, um, but diatomaceous earth um, is one. You can try disturbing them and just having them move. A lot of times, I'll just do ant bait on the ground outside of my garden. So there, there are things that are labeled for ants, but I just, again, I'm very cautious with what I put in the garden. Um, so be careful with that. Um, but there are some options out there. You can plow for your grubs, okay, uh, is a great one um, in increasing some of those, those birds as well. Grasshoppers and kitty dids, pick them off. Same thing with beetles if you can, okay. Um, but remember, your grubs are your beetle babies, so. Let me go back to this question right here. Will, chicken eat, will chickens eat ants? Uh, does anybody know the answer to that question? I don't know if they'll eat fire ants. We'll see if maybe somebody answers. Ducks do, somebody said. I, I, don't, I don't know the answer to that question. <laughs> and, and then somebody said yes and everything else in your garden, yes. Um, Muscovies are great for that. Just be careful with Muscovies. Remember they are an invasive species, so um, they are not supposed to be here. Um, somebody said chickens really do. Uh, isn't spinosad toxic to bees? Uh, I don't know that it necessarily is. I wouldn't be spraying, um, it does not have a bee label on it. I will tell you that. So things like imidacloprid have bee labels. Uh, we call them the pollinator protection box. Um, your clothinidin would have a, a pollinator label on there. So those are your neonicotinoids. Um, and those are not ones we typically recommend uh, in the garden anyway, okay? Um, but again, check the label. If you are a beekeeper like I am, I don't typically, you know, I, I have a threshold, it's, it's, it's pretty high, um, uh, but uh, it's not one that we, we take out for bees, like that we, we know we're cautious for bees. Um, and I don't think it has a bee label on it, but always check and read the labels just to make sure that it's correct for your situation. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, if you're interested in this, we do have a IPM field laboratory. It's a living laboratory. This is a really cool publication um, about it. It's in Swanee County. Uh, and it kind of goes through some of the other practices that you can do. Um, and so we will have that available for you. And then this is my contact information um, and my favorite little gardeners there. Those are my kids. Uh, but my contact information, uh, emails on there, phones on there, um, and you guys can always know you can can get to us through Facebook as well, um, or email. Okay, send us pictures and for questions. Uh, does anybody have anything else? It's about twelve ten. So um, if I don't see any questions, Thanks everybody. So somebody asked, where's this information going to be available? Great question. Um, if you are on the Victory Garden group, um, it is on the courses or it's being posted on the courses as part of the modules and then also in a resource tab. Also it's on YouTube as well. Um, and I'm blanking on the name. I think if you go search for Victory 2020 Gardens, you should be able to find our YouTube channel. We've, we're posting more so that we can can uh, people can find us a little bit better. Um, but that's where it's being posted through through our state office. Our state master gardener office is helping us with that. Um, so it is on YouTube as well. And so we have not gotten the tomato one up yet. I don't think she's working on that. 
Um, we've gotten some of the other ones up, um, but they are there. Oh, and then if you did register on Eventbrite, I'll email those out too. Yeah. That way you don't have to go hunt for it. <laughs> so. Thanks, guys.